Can you see him there on the right hand side? He's a little bit elongated for some reason. Uh, that's him on the right hand side, and his nephew is the cardinal in the red robe standing in front of him, and his nephew will eventually become uh, Pope Julius II, and it was that man who hired Michelangelo to paint the Sistine Chapel ceiling. So we've got uh, the uncle there on the right hand side, who's Sixtus IV. He's the one that is going to commission and build the original chapel and put some uh, initial decorations into it. And then a few years later, his nephew is going to become Pope Julius II, and he's going to hire Michelangelo to paint uh, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. The Sistine Chapel, actually, uh, it was built out of necessity. There, uh, there is a series of liturgical ceremonies that have to take place following the liturgical calendar of the Catholic Church, which involve the Pope over the course of a year. And uh, some of these can be performed in St. Peter's Basilica. I think there are about eight of those that demand the Pope's presence uh, over the high altar in St. Peter's Basilica. But there are 42 other ceremonies that need to be performed in a smaller chapel. And uh, this is the chapel then that Sixtus IV built. Actually, he replaced an earlier chapel on the site. And this is what it looked like in the uh, 15th century. Uh, you can see, uh, right, you see where that sort of uh, tower is, and there's a banner flying on top of that tower? Right to the left of that, that fortress looking thing is the Sistine Chapel. Okay, that's the Sistine Chapel that was built by Sixtus IV. And what you're looking at right here um, is the old St. Peter's, the original St. Peter's that was built by the Emperor Constantine in the 4th century. And this stood until uh, 1506 when that Pope, Julius II, knocked it down and put up the, the, the basilica that's there today. So it doesn't look anything like this. Uh, and, and the other, uh, this series of towers over here on the right hand side, uh, in, um, it's, it form, they form part of a rectangle, and that's the Papal Palace. That's a medieval Papal Palace. And so you can see that the Papal Palace is, it butts right up to the Sistine Chapel right there. Okay, so this is what it looked like when it was built. Uh, and and uh, uh, originally with the old St. Peter's. And I want to show you sort of a before and after. That's what it looked like back then. And if you go to Rome now, you're going to have trouble finding it. <laughs> it's uh, uh, the, the new St. Peter's. You can see it right here. There's that huge piazza in the front of it and the new grandiose St. Peter's. And in addition to that, uh, Pope Julius II, his name's going to keep coming up again and again and again, um, went on a building there, and one of the things that he did was he built a huge palace, the Vatican Palace. You can see it running all the way from the side of St. Peter's up here, all the way up to the top of the, sl the top of the slide up there. That's the Vatican Palace. And so when you go to Rome today and you go to the Vatican Museums, that's where you're going to go, right? You're going to go to the Vatican Palace. And what you have to do is you, uh, you enter way up there at the top and you walk the length of the Vatican Palace and come down here to the Sistine Chapel and see the Sistine Chapel. And then you have to turn around and walk all the way back out. <laughs> it's a long hike. Take your lunch with you. Um, but the thing about it is you can barely see the Sistine Chapel anymore because it's behind a, a series of buildings that have been uh, uh, put up in the intro. Okay, so that's why it was uh, built. It was built for ceremonial purposes to house uh, the performance of liturgy that involved the Pope. And uh, that's, uh, it, it was built and replaced an earlier chapel, which was in a dilapidated state. It was begun in the year 1477. It took seven years to finish. Uh, the first service was conducted in, I think, August of 1483. 1483. All right. Now, as far as the inside of it goes, this is what it looks like. And it, 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 the first time you walk into the uh, Sistine Chapel, you're just simply overwhelmed. You can't make any sense out of it because there's just too much. And so one of the things that I'm going to do for you is to help you make sense out of what you're looking at right there because once you understand what's going on, it's really easy. It's really easy. As a matter of fact, it's just a height of simplicity. But the first time you walk in there, um, it's just, uh, it, it, it's just uh, far, far too much. Now, what you see when you go into the Sistine Chapel today is a finished product, but it didn't start out looking that way at all. Uh, when it was built originally by Pope Sixtus IV back in the, uh, the, the 1470s, uh, he hired a series or a, a group of Florentine painters to come in, and he hired them to paint this first register down here on the bottom. You see those frescoes running down here on the bottom? That's what he hired them to paint. Okay, that's the first campaign, and directly above this first register of paintings, and we'll talk about those in a, a, a couple more classes. There was also, up, up there by where the windows are, you can see the windows, they painted a series of images of the popes as well. So the first painting, the first decoration, included this bottom register right here, and on one side we have the life of Christ, and on the other side we have the life of Moses. 
And then above that is a register depicting the popes. Okay, so that's the first campaign that was done in the 1470s. A few years later, uh, when uh, Julius II had become pope, he hired Michelangelo to come back and to paint the ceiling. And that's what you're looking at right there, that massive ceiling up there. Michelangelo painted the ceiling. And then uh, a few years later, in uh, the 1530s, when Paul III was pope, he hired Michelangelo to come back and to paint uh, actually the altar wall. This is the other end of the thing right here, the altar wall. You see the high altar right there. And Michelangelo put uh, what's called the resurrection of the dead there on that. Okay. So by looking at this painting, you, you can see this image right here. You can see the three campaigns. We've got the uh, frescoes on the side walls, which were painted first. You can see the popes up there by the windows. You see just a little bit of Michelangelo's ceiling up there. And then you can see the resurrection of the dead right there. So three different campaigns to decorate the Sistine Chapel. All right, you got any questions over that so far? I, I've never been there. What do they, how do they preserve that paint? That's a really good question. As a matter of fact, for years and years and years and years, they deteriorated. Uh, and one of the reasons for this, it wasn't a maliciousness or anything, uh, but uh, the Catholic liturgy, um, they had candles all over the place, right? There were candles lighting, uh, you can see on the high altar there, and there were candles and incense. And what happened over the centuries was <laughs> that the, the, the frescoes become, uh, the, there was a, a thick layer of smoke covering these frescoes. And uh, careers were made and careers were destroyed commenting on the drab colors that Michelangelo used in his frescoes. And about 10 years ago, um, a Japanese company paid for the cleaning of all the frescoes, particularly Michelangelo's uh, ceiling frescoes, and people were just blown away at the colors. Right? So it's, it's been a long process. Uh, so the they, process they of don't deterioration. Have to special to preserve them? Or? Uh, well, right now what they do is uh, you go in and uh, you'll, you'll never see the Sistine Chapel looking like this because there are no people in there. But if you walk in today, there are guards, not guards, well, I guess you call them guards, uh, people, uh, custodians, uh, and they, they forbid you to take any pictures. Uh, the theory is that the, the, the flash is going to destroy uh, the frescoes which is garbage, of course, because, you know, they're, they're 40 feet up there. Yeah. What they really want you to do is not take pictures, so you have to buy the books they have on sale that are, <laughs> that are, are doing that. But uh, they do, they take really good care of these things, and every now and then they get cracks and stuff like that. Yeah. And at one point, uh, they came back, and because Marjolangelo painted a lot of nudes, and they sort of painted bikini skivvies on them and stuff like that, and that's all been taken, taken uh, off as well. All right, any other questions about this? See, you already know so much more about the Sistine Chapel than you did five minutes ago. <laughs> it's really not all that hard. It's really not all that hard. Okay, let's go back to this right here. And if you uh, uh, take a look down at that handout, I gave meaning of the iconography of the Sistine Chapel. Um, the first thing that you have to admire about this is, although the, the paintings and the frescoes were done in stages, uh, that they were very well thought out and that there is a unity, a really, really tight unity uh, to the message that is behind all of those frescoes. And so we're going to start with the ceiling, which was actually the second campaign. But if you follow me here, the meeting of the iconography of the Sistine Chapel, the ceiling frescoes tell the story of creation, the fall of mankind, the destruction of the world, and the preservation of Noah and his family. And this is what Michelangelo did. Uh, beginning in 1508 or so, there are nine panels on the ceiling right there in the center, right? That center stretch down through there. Uh, there are nine panels uh, running the length of the Sistine Chapel, and that's what's being discussed right there. And it, in other words, it shows uh, the perfection of creation uh, uh, when, uh, when God first created uh, the, the heavens and the earths and mankind, and then Adam and Eve messing it up, right? They screw it up and they get kicked out of the Garden of Eden. God is so mad that he destroys the world, but, uh, but he, saves, he saves Noah and Noah's family. Uh, and that's what's being depicted there on, on, on the top. Now, after that, there are down here, uh, let's go back, let me see. Hang on just a second right here. Okay, uh, this is a slide, this is a great slide because it shows you what it looked like before Michael Angel did the ceiling, right? Okay, and you can see what we have essentially is what's called a barrel vault, right? It's a round roof on this thing right here, and there are six windows on either side right there with cutouts above the windows. You see what I'm talking about, those triangular cutouts on the windows? Okay, so what Michelangelo did was he came in and he put uh, in those... Uh, 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 the, the triangles above the windows, he put images of what are considered to be the ancestors of Christ as listed in the Gospel of Matthew. And those go all the way around the room, okay? Go all the way around the room. And he also 
put in uh, the, the, the area between the windows, there's a sort of a triangular thing coming down like this, uh, which is called a pendentive. That's what the uh, our art historians call that. And there he put a series of prophets, in a, uh, a pagan and um, Old Testament prophets. And uh, if we go back then, you can see this is what he's done right here. You see how he's filled in those triangles above the windows right there with images of the ancestors of Christ. And then we've also got prophets running along the top as well. So that's the ceiling. So what we do is we start out with a, a, a depiction of creation, perfect creation, and Adam and Eve mess it up, and God gets angry and destroys the world, which means that we need a Savior, right? We need a Savior. This is what's going on in the ceiling. Things get so messed up, starts out perfectly, things get so messed up that we need a Savior. And what we have then is, along the, uh, uh, the windows right there, we have prophecy about the Savior who is going to come. That's what the prophets, the pagan and the Old Testament prophets are doing. And then we have, to tie it all together, we have the lineage of Christ as it's given in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, and this ties Christ then back to the Old Testament as well as to the New Testament. Directly under that, this is again uh, filling in right here, uh, the argument of course uh, by the Catholic Church is that uh, uh, Christ gave uh, authority to Peter to be the shepherd of all the flock and putting Peter in, in charge of the faith and establishing the church through Peter. And consequently we have that image of those uh, popes uh, directly underneath the prophets right there. And then what we have coming on down here, on one side we have the life of Moses, which is the Old Covenant. And then on the other side we have the life of Christ, which is the New Covenant. So we have the Old Law, and then the New Law is replaced, uh, uh, Christ replaces the Old Covenant with the New Covenant. And then finally what we have is no salvation outside of the church. You see that right there? It's a really, really tight theological program that we're getting. Okay, you all follow that? Yeah, so next time you go to the Sistine Chapel, you can just wow the people you're with by saying, oh, by the way. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, you're so far, you're either odd or you're just a who was, if you remember, he was in the belly of the whale for three days, right? And, 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 and then he's freed from the belly of the whale. And uh, interpreters, Christian interpreters, took that as being a, a, a foretelling of, the, of Christ and Christ's death and resurrection. And so Jonah, the Old Testament prophet, is put right over the high altar right there, right, to symbolize then Christ triumph over death uh, and the, actually the bringing together of the Old Testament and the New Testament right there as well. Ron? Yes, please. Can you explain the word civil? Yeah, I will. We're, you're going to have a whole ten minutes on civil. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, here's a prophet Jeremiah, and uh, the reason that Michelangelo has picked uh, these seven prophets is, and I've given you some of their prophecies, this is uh, attached to that uh, uh, handout that says, Meaning of the Iconography of the Sistine Chapel. If you open that up, uh, what I've done is I've gathered uh, a number of the prophecies that were found in the writings of these Old Testament prophets, which Christians took to be foretelling of the coming of the Messiah. Foretelling of the coming of the Messiah. Uh, and let me uh, get to mine right here. Uh, let me see. Yeah, Jeremiah, for instance. If you look uh, down under number 13. Uh, okay, so Jeremiah, in, in his writings, talks about uh, a, a Messiah, and he says that this Messiah will be born of a virgin. Uh, and this was uh, fulfilled, of, of course, in the New Testament, uh, Christ being born of a virgin. Also, uh, Jeremiah argued that the Messiah would be a descendant of David, and you can find claims for this in the New Testament as well. And so you can see Messiah, uh, uh, this uh, uh, proponent of the idea of the Messiah, the foretelling of the Messiah that uh, Michelangelo was painted there in the system of the ceiling. I like this a lot. I think it's an awful lot because you can see him. He's pretty, you know, Jeremiah was alive at the time. Uh, he saw the destruction, or very, very fearful, and saw the destruction uh, of, of the kingdom of, uh, of Judah. And you can see him. He's, he's going around, you know, he's talking about uh, uh, Israel is going to be destroyed. Israel is going to be destroyed. And you see him sort of very, very pensive and brooding right there. Uh, and then. Uh, just a couple more of these Old, Old Testament prophets, Ezekiel, and Ezekiel, of course, is prophesying about the coming of the Messiah. And there you can see Jonah over the right hand side. I love this. Look at that big fish. Doesn't look like a big comet or something like that. <laughs> getting ready to, uh, getting ready to uh, swallow Jonah. This is actually, 
if you look at Jonah right there, this is one of the most amazing things you're ever going to lay your eyes on right there because it looks like it's flat, doesn't it? But it's it's actually on a curve. It's on a huge curve right there. And his head is, uh, it is, is actually closer to you than his legs are, right? Because his legs are at the bottom of the curve and his, uh, and his head is at the top. But it all looks to be uh, uh, as, uh, correct uh, according to anatomy. Uh, absolutely uh, uh, something that uh, he had sold at Michelangelo. Okay, so what would Luther's reaction to this be, to these prophets uh, up there on the ceiling? And my sense is uh, that Luther would have fully embraced the presence of these Old Testament prophets on the ceiling. Uh, it was part of his intellectual uh, 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 what? His intellectual makeup as a Christian and as a theologian. For instance, uh, we know from his commentaries on Genesis and his commentaries, particularly on the Psalms, that Luther fully embraced the idea that the Old Testament was full of prophecies, prophetic revelations about the coming of Christ. He would be completely, completely at ease seeing these Old Testament prophets on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Uh, he would think this is something that's very appropriate, right? Uh, he would not have any trouble with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so uh, he also, the other thing that's interesting about this is if you look at, for instance, Ezekiel over here, uh, you can see these little urchins behind them, uh, behind Ezekiel, and there's also one, uh, if we go back and we look at uh, the prophet Jeremiah, you can see uh, 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 figures behind uh, the prophet Jeremiah, and these are taken to be the voices of inspiration, the voices of inspiration sent by God. And Luther, of course, fully believed that Scripture was uh, inspired by God, right? That God inspired uh, the prophets, that God inspired Paul, and that uh, consequently Scripture itself was inspired. So he would also, uh, I think, embrace the, the iconography that you're looking at right there as well. All right, any questions over there? Okay, so well, far so good. What were the, the, the pagan uh, prophets? What kind of contribution did they Ah, okay. Those are the siblings, right? Well, you should bring that up. Uh, yeah, there they are. <laughs> okay, the pagan prophets. Uh, prophetesses, they were, uh, uh, these, uh, there were 12 of them, and the writings of these prophetesses uh, uh, were well known in classical Greece and classical Rome, Roman times. That is, I'm going all the way back to around 200 BCE, all the way up through the time of, uh, around the birth of Christ. Uh, and, 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 and their works, uh, there were 12 of them all together, and their works uh, became very popular in Europe during the Renaissance. A lot of them were written in, 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 in Greek, and uh, the, the scholars of the Renaissance learned to uh, read Greek, and so they developed an appreciation for the writings of these uh, uh, prophetesses. Uh, and there, uh, uh, there are five of them that are being depicted on, on the ceiling, the Persian Sybil, the Erythrean Sybil, the Delphic Sibyl, uh, Sibyl, the Cumean Sibyl, and the Libyan Sibyl. And the reason um, that uh, our art historians give for the particular selection of these five is that they are geographically diverse. They come from the different, uh, one comes from Europe, one comes from Africa, one comes from Greece, one comes from Persia, and one comes from Asia. So the idea here is that God revealed himself to the pagans uh, all across the world in, in a very, very timely fashion. Uh, and their writings, again, their writings were well known in the Renaissance, uh, and they were deeply appreciated because uh, there was a feeling uh, that was embraced by theologians and scholars during the Renaissance uh, that God revealed himself to all people at all times. As a matter of fact, you find this in the writings of Paul, right? Uh, Paul makes the argument, and I think it's in Romans, um, that even if the gospel had not been preached to people, that they should recognize God because of the majesty of creation. Uh, but these uh, uh, these uh, sibylline oracles, is what they are called, are much more specific than that, um, to the point that they seem, at least Christians <coughs> during the period, seem to have found specific references in their writings to the Messiah. Right? Specific references in their writings to the Messiah. And they embrace this. They embrace this because it was a, a testimony that uh, Paul's right, that, that God had in fact revealed himself to all people at all times. Okay, does that answer your questions about these sibyls? Yes, go ahead. What does sibyl mean? Uh, uh, someone who prophesizes. Oh, 
Yeah, that's that's what it means. So, and and many of these were well known. Uh, the Delphic Sibyl, uh, uh, you, you find references to the Delphic uh, Sibyl um, in, in mythology and in Greek history all the time. That uh, Delphi is uh, probably about a hundred miles from Athens, and people would trot out there in the mountains, and they would ask her questions, and she would give them these really really puzzling answers. Yeah, uh -huh. and recognize all the geographic areas except for the uh, you mean, that's, uh, it, it's a cave down in southern Italy, so that's Roman, she's actually Roman, yeah. And she, uh, her writings are absolutely astounding because uh, Christians interpreted uh, her writings. Uh, uh, she is um, uh, believed to have actually foretold to Caesar Augustus, as the first Roman emperor, that there's a Messiah that has been born and that there's going to be a church which is going to be founded in this religion, is going to spread all across the empire. Sort of jaw-dropping stuff. Yeah. Now, whether that's actually what she said, we don't know. But that's how they interpreted the, the, the sort of you know. What the time, around the time period for those symbols? Yeah, uh, anywhere from around 200 BCE up until the time of Caesar Augustus, which is right around the time of the birth of Christ. Right? Yeah. And the Delphic symbol goes way back even earlier than that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Wait. Sorry. Symbol is always used for women prophets. Yeah. Yeah. Female prophets. And it ends up being not so much anymore when I was a kid. A lot of Civil. Yeah. But there was also a popular movie yeah. so yeah. that yeah. Anyway, uh, so Michelangelo has painted these, and, and, and there are five of them, if we can go back. Uh, there are five of them. Here's the Persian Civil right here, and this is the Eritrean Civil right here. The Delphic uh, Civil is up there in the left-hand corner. Uh, the Cumaean Civil, she's standing on her head right here, right in the middle. Uh, she's, uh, I, I did a little picture of her in the PowerPoint, but she's this big muscular thing. Like, uh, you know, she could squat you over the back of her hand. And then over here we have the lovely uh, uh, Libyan Sibyl as well, one of the most beautiful uh, images of a woman that Michelangelo has ever done. There's a Persian Sibyl, you can see her book, right? There's her sublime oracle, and you can see behind her is that image of inspiration as well, right? uh, the idea that God has inspired these Sibyls uh, with knowledge. Over there on the left, there's the Erythrian Sibyl. Uh, she is associated with uh, the coast of Ionia, which is modern-day Turkey on the Aegean. And then over here, the, the Delphic, uh, Delphic uh, Sibyl right there on, on, on the right-hand side as well. Okay, so the question is, what would Luther's reaction be to these Sibyls? What would Luther's reaction be to these Sibyls? Um, as far as I know, I have never uh, uh, run across any mention of the Sibyls in, in, in Luther's writings. Pastor Jim, have you ever come across anything? I have I not. Uh, and I, it, it's not, I don't think, that he didn't know about them because they were very popular among artists and they were very popular among writers and theologians all across Europe. There's uh, uh, publications in Germany around the time of Luther that bear images of these Sibyls. So I don't think it's that Luther was oblivious to these uh, symbols, but he just never mentions them. My sense is that he would not, would maybe a few reservations have objected to these symbols up there on the ceiling. And the reason for this is that he agrees with Paul that God revealed himself to all people at all times. And I think to this extent, he would have said, all right, perhaps it's, you know, it's possible. I, I think he would have said, it's possible. Don't ask me if I believe it's true or not. Yeah, I, I think he would have said, sure, it's possible. So I don't think that he would have uh, outright objected to these uh, uh, images of these uh, pagan <coughs> female prophetesses on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. All right, any, any other questions about either the Old Testament prophets or the symbols? So... Let's just take a brief look back. So what we've done is we have talked about here on uh, 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 this bottom rank right here, we've talked about the Old Testament prophets and the uh, uh, pagan prophets and the same thing, that upper rank right there. So you understand what's going on right there. Now what I want to do is I want to move to this central panel. And there are actually nine panels right here that he has painted. Uh, down here we have the creation of, of, of the world. The first four panels dealing with the creation of, of heaven and earth. Uh, and then we have the creation of Adam right here. Uh, we have the creation of Eve. And then we have the temptation of Eve. And then we get into these final three panels dealing with Noah and the destruction of the earth. And so what I want to do is, uh, the time remaining, I'm going to focus on these first two panels right here. But there are a couple of things that you need to know about this. Uh, and, 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 the, and the first thing is, 
um, that the entry, the main entry to the Sistine Chapel is actually, that is the entry where the Pope would come in, is down here. Okay, the high altar is down on this end down here. This is where the image of Jonah is, and it's where creation begins. But you actually, if you were the Pope and if you were the papal, uh, members of the papal chapel, you would enter in down here and you would walk the entire length of the chapel until you got up here to where the high altar is, and then you would sit. Um, and there are, there are stairs, and a lot of the clergy would sit on the stairs. There's actually a throne for the Pope. Let me go back and let me see if, yeah, right here. Um, on the other side of that screen, so they would march in this way, the high altar's up there, they would march in this way through what's called a rood screen right here, and take their seats uh, up and around the high altar, and the Pope's uh, throne would be, uh, or chair would be over here on that left-hand wall right there. Okay, so as they're walking down, uh, down the, uh, uh, the center of the chapel, but they're going to come in down here, and they're going to start with the destruction of Noah and make their way all the way down there. So around it. Yep. You, you have you have the painting of Jonah at, at, the, at the over the high altar. Yeah. Over the high altar. Mm -hmm. The chronology. I'm just kind of curious why the, the placement of those paintings because it doesn't seem to follow the chronology. If you have the painting of Jonah here, which is the very should be the very last fresco, right? Because that's that tells of the resurrection of Christ. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. So, but then the starting of the prophets. Is that the same end? It just doesn't seem logical. It's no, actually, it, it, it's very logical if you stop and think about it. If we go back here to look, right? So, so what we have is uh, the prophets, uh, they, they start up here and they work their way all around. And what we get is, so you've got the Old Testament prophets. And then finally, you have Jonah, uh, who's the last prophet, right over the high altar right, right. here. It's simple, because the Catholic Mass, here's what you need to know about the Catholic Mass, which was offered up on that altar. Catholics believe that when we call it communion, the Lord's Supper, that when the Mass was celebrated, that Christ was literally offered up on the cross again, right? That he died, and he died once again, and that he was, but through his death, he was going to give eternal life. That's why it makes sense to have Jonah up above the altar right there, right? Yeah. So actually, it brings together then the Old Testament prophecies with what Christ is actually doing. See, that's how it, that, that's how it's tied together. Okay. Uh, the other thing that you need to know about this is, and you will look at this and you'll say, well, yeah, I never thought about that. If you look at the, those nine panels right there, you will see that what Michelangelo has done is, and he has to do this because of the windows, he alternates a small panel with a large panel with a small panel with a large panel. You see what I'm talking about? Every other painting is small or large. You see, you see uh, how he does this? Here's a large painting. There's a, a small painting. Here's a large painting. Small painting, large, small, large, small, large, and, and, and small again. Uh, and he does this in part because of the windows. Uh, there's something else which uh, happens as well, and that is uh, in, in the, the first uh, uh, year or so when Michelangelo was painting, the entire thing, uh, this half down here, because he starts down here and he works his way down this way. Okay? He starts down here with uh, uh, Noah and he works his way down to the creation of the earth. Uh, he's up there painting away for about a year, a year and a half or something like that. And he finally says, okay, I'm going to see what it looks like. So he removes the scaffold and he's standing down here and he's saying, Holy cow, you can't hardly see anything. <laughs> it's so tiny, I can barely see what I painted up there. And so by the time we get down here to the creation of Eve, he has changed his style. And what he does is he starts painting huge figures. You see that? They're much easier to read. When you get down here to Eve, it's much easier to read these figures on down here than it is up here. He simplifies because he's, he's used to painting frescoes on a wall where people see it like right there right and so he you know he packs everything that he can possibly into these frescoes but he realizes when he removes the scaffold and he starts looking up there he says I can't make any sense out of that if I can't make any sense out of that how can you and so what he does is he changes then he he, he, he simplifies the iconography and he also makes the, uh, the 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 people in the iconography a lot larger as well so again the next time you go to the Sistine Chapel you say oh by the way did you realize and you're just gonna <laughs> All right, any questions over that? Okay, all right. So, what I want to do is, I want to focus on uh, these first two uh, uh, frescoes, these first two panels down here, and uh, tell you what's going on, and give you what I think would be Luther's reaction to those. Uh, the first uh, fresco that we're going to be looking at deals with God separating light from darkness, and in the second panel, Michelangelo has depicted God creating the earth and the sun and the moon. Okay, so let's do this. 
get out of here. All right, so the work of the first day of creation. This is what Michelangelo is working from. Okay, this is the text in Genesis. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And this is what Michelangelo has depicted, this, this, that, that particular verse right there. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And this is what Michelangelo has painted right here. Okay, you can see God, then you can see the light over here on the right-hand side, and then the darkness over there on the left-hand side, and God is separating, and right, you see separating the light from the darkness uh, in this fresco. Uh, there's a lot going on right here. Well, actually, it's a very simple painting of God uh, separating the light from the darkness, but all of these, these other four figures, they are called nudes. Ignudi is what the Italian word is. Uh, and there's something really interesting about these ignudi, particularly ones you're looking at right here. Remember I started out showing you a slide of Sixtus IV and his nephew, uh, uh, who's eventually going to be Julius II. Their name is, they are, their family name is the Delle Rovere. Rovere is Italian for oak. And if you look not too closely, you'll see acorns spattered all over this particular panel, right? You can see the acorns over here and the acorns over here, right? So we have a, a non too subtle reminder of who's paying for all of this. <laughs> uh, Pope Julius II, member of the Della Rovere family. Okay, so we get this majestic uh, image of God, God looking up right here, um, uh, looking up, you can barely see his nose, and this is a, a little tuft of beard underneath there, uh, busy separating the light from the darkness. Well, Luther, in his commentary on Genesis, spent a lot of time discussing the first day of creation. And I think he would find much to like here, much to like here. First off, well, let's take a look and see what Luther has to say, okay? And this is uh, Luther's commentary on Genesis. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And here's Luther again. He says, I have said that in the beginning there was created through the word that uh, unformed mass of earth and heaven, and heavens he calls, uh, uh, is, is what uh, Moses is calling the waters, right? That, that in the beginning God created heaven and earth. And Luther's making the argument that when uh, Moses uses the word heavens, he really means water. So in the beginning God created mass of water and a mass of, of, of earth. And that this must be a sign to the work of the first day, although this is the first time Moses speaks thus. God said, let there be light. However, this expression, that is, God said, let there be light, is indeed remarkable and unknown to the writers of all of the languages, that through his speaking, God makes something out of nothing. And so here for the first time, Moses mentions the means and the instrument God used doing his work, namely the word. Right? In other words, what Luther's arguing here is that when God creates, God spoke, right? It always says, and God said. And Luther takes that to mean that that is, he's creating through the word, which Luther understands to be Christ, the Logos, right? The, the word of reason. You see this in John. Now I'll compare this with the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word. He is in proper agreement with Moses. Right? So Luther's arguing that God is creating through the world. Uh, through the word, uh, word itself. All right. Uh, I, I think that, uh, first of all, uh, one of the things that Luther would like an awful lot about this is um, that God is actually creating. And if you uh, uh, attended my lectures on Luther's commentary on, on creation out of Genesis, you will recall that there was a huge debate going on at this time whether the world was eternal and had always existed or whether it actually had been created. This was a huge debate going on at the time. And uh, this is, it, it's problematic for Christians uh, because, uh, well, just let me throw this out there. Have you ever seen anything created out of nothing? Shake your heads, no. You have never seen anything created out of nothing. And this is Aristotelian logic that, you know, it's just unlogical that something can be created out of nothing. And this caused all sorts of problems for people like Luther and other Christians who believe that in the beginning God created heaven and earth. And so Luther, uh, is, is, in his commentary on Genesis, spends a lot of time making the argument that God actually created out of nothing heaven and earth. And I think he would have liked this an awful lot because you see this is what Michelangelo is doing as well. He is affirming the fact that in the beginning God created the world, that the world had not always existed. And this is very, very important. The other thing that's going on here 
And you can see this in those first four frames on the ceiling, those first four panels is, God is bringing order out of chaos. God is bringing order out of chaos. In the beginning, God creates a lot of water, and he creates all of this really, really sort of um, uh, uh, this glop of earth, which is pretty well saturated with, with land, but it's formless. In the beginning, the earth was without form and void. And what Luther's going to argue, what other Christian uh, theologians argued at the point at, at the time was that what God does is after he creates these initial elements, he brings order out of them. And you see this is what God is doing here. He's bringing order out of chaos. And this is actually what the word cosmos means. It means order, right? Cosmos, order. This is where we get order from. So I think Luther would like that as well. God is busy involved in, in, in cosmos, that is, in, in bringing order to creation as well. All right. Uh, two things would bother him about this, however. Uh, and, and the first is uh, the fact that you see God is very busy and very active physically separating the light from the darkness, right? That's what he's doing. He's out there physically, almost like he's pulling them apart, physically separating the light from the darkness. If you take a look at what we just read here with Luther, what Luther says is that God said, let there be light. However, this expression is indeed remarkable and unknown to the writers of all other languages, that through his speaking, God makes something out of nothing. And I think that what Luther would object to right here is the fact that God is not speaking, but rather he's physically creating. He's physically creating because in his commentary on Genesis again and again and again and again, Luther argues that God created through the word, which was Christ, right? That God, in fact, uses Christ to bring order and uses Christ to, uh, uh, to create heaven and earth and man. And, I, and, and, and Luther is adamant about the fact that you can actually see the Trinity, right? You can see the Trinity in the book of Genesis when God creates. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And I think to that extent that he would object to this, that, that God is actually rolling up his sleeve and physically getting involved in creation. I think he would also object somewhat to the overall way in which Michelangelo has chose to depict God, not just in this scene, but in the first four panels that we're going to look at. God, the God of Michelangelo, is majestic, he's powerful, he's awesome. And I think that Luther, and I take this from having read Luther's commentary on Genesis, I think Luther would have objected to this very, very stern and very, very awesome depiction of God. Um, Luther, as a matter of fact, uh, saw God as being very beneficent. And he argued then that as God is creating, that God is, is he's, a, he's, he's a father. He's looking out for his creation. He's looking out for mankind. Um, and that, uh, that his God is a very, very forgiving God and a very, very loving God. And I think it's really interesting <coughs> If we take a look, uh, oops, we're going the wrong way. Take a look at this illustration right here, which was produced in Luther's uh, 1534 edition of, of his Bible. Look at God the Father right there. Look at God the Father right there. And then go ahead and let's just take a look. Look at God the Father right there. You see that? You see that very, very awesome and very powerful and no-nonsense God right there saying, you know, sun over here, moon over here, and then i got to go on. And then you look back over here. Oops. Oh, we lost it. Where did it come? There. Look at that God. Isn't that a much friendlier, much warmer, and much more kind God? Yeah, yeah it is. I think uh, my was a great God. He had no fear of God, and he looked at God in a different way. You know what? That depiction of God, this depiction of God right here, that's the God that Luther's running from. That's the God that Luther's running from right there. Right? This is an unforgiving God. This is a God that de demands punishment. This is a God that is going to send people to purgatory. And this explains why you need the church. This is, explains why you need penance. This explains why you need to do good works. You see what's being enforced up here on the Sistine Chapel ceiling is the Catholic notion of a very angry, very righteous God. And while Luther goes on record as saying, I hated God, the God, the righteous God that demanded that I try to do enough good works to get my soul out of purgatory. 
And I think he would object. He, he would have objected to this this uh, yeah. a particular uh, way that my financial has been gotten. That's right. Or All pay right, enough indulgences so you can keep painting. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, let me see. Oh, uh, so let's go on in. Uh, oh, the next panel. Yeah. All right. Oh, this one. Yeah, let's talk about this for just a second. This is the next panel. This is the next panel of, uh, depicting creation. Um, and I think that Luther would have been uh, shocked by this panel. Absolutely shocked by this panel and deeply, deeply bothered by this panel. Um, and I will tell you why. Uh, uh, he would have believed, walking in the Sistine Chapel and looking up their creation, uh, that this second panel should logically have depicted events on the second day of creation. Uh, as it's described in the Bible. And that tells us that God, uh, he, he created a firmament in the heavens. That is, he created a hard, hard dome around the earth and he put water on top of that dome and he put water underneath that dome. This is not what Michelangelo is depicted in this second panel right here. He actually depicts the events of the second day in the third panel. So this panel is out of order. This panel is out of order. Uh, and uh, what we're uh, seeing depicted right here is the creation of the earth, uh, which took place on the third day, and the creation of the sun and the moon and the stars uh, on the fourth day, and so they are out of order. And I think that would have bothered Michelangelo or, 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 or Luther an awful lot. And the reason for this is uh, that he believed, as he's commentating or, or delivering his commentary on Genesis, that God worked in a very, very logical and rational order. And let's see what he has to say right here. Um, yeah, the work of the third day. Uh, yeah. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. So this is the creation of, of, of earth. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, uh, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding the seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. Okay, this would have driven uh, uh, Luther crazy because uh, Luther believed that God worked in a very, very logical fashion. And listen to what he says right here. Uh, uh, commenting on the first step of creation when God created the prim uh, primordial matter. This is Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 1. The very simple meaning of what Moses says, uh, therefore, is this. Everything that is was created by God. Furthermore, at the beginning of the first day were created the crude mass of mire or of earth and the mist or waters. Into these, within the remaining space of the first day, God introduced light and made the day appear. In order to expose to view the crude mass of heaven and earth, rather like an elementary seed, but one suited for producing something. So we have here in the first day, we have water created and earth created, but the water is covering the earth. Now listen to what happens on this uh, 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 creation um, uh, on the second day. Uh, Luther, in commenting on these events, had argued that the work of day two was necessary precursor for uh, to the emergence of dry land. In other words, God moved in a very logical order. The first day he created this miry mass of earth and then he created water which is covering the earth. And then on the second day, uh, after bottling up most of the water above the firmament, he had then turned to those dregs which remained behind after the heavens had been made from it by the word. So on the second day, God bottles up the water up here and down here, puts the water in order, and then that allows him to, uh, on, the, uh, on the third day, to congregate the remaining water in dry land and pews. In other words, you've got to have the creation of primordial matter, you've got to have the separation of the waters, and then you can create dry land. But Michelangelo has, has it out of order. He's got the creation of primordial matter, and then he immediately goes to the creation of the earth. This would have driven Luther long. It, it just, he, God said for him, uh, works in a very, very logical and, and methodical way, and I think that uh, it would have bothered him enormously. So he would not have liked that a bit. Okay, uh, and finally, and we'll wrap it up right here. Uh, moving on to, uh, and, and so he's got two scenes here, right? He's got the third day and the fourth day here in this particular scene in the second. Um, and and uh, you can see the earth over here. Uh, the earth is, uh, it's been created. The waters have been brought away, and then it's starting to produce 
vegetation. And then over here on the fourth day, you can see God is creating uh, the, the luminaries up in the heavens. He's creating the sun and he's creating the moon. Okay. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Luther uh, spent a lot of time talking about uh, what happens on the fourth day. Uh, he was very much in tune to uh, what it meant for God to create the sun and the moon. He thought that with the creation of sun, that time had actually been introduced because he argues that without the sun, without the planetary movements, there is no uh, measurement of time. Um, I think he would have appreciated what, uh, at least what uh, uh, God is, or Michelangelo is trying to do here. I don't think he would have liked that depiction of God uh, at, at the same time, however. All right, any questions? Yes, please. The question on all the panels, how much flexibility did Michelangelo have on what he was going to put up there, or was he told kind of ideas to do? Or? Yeah, that's a really good question. How much uh, authorship did Michelangelo have all over this? Um, and uh, the answer is we're just not exactly sure about that. Michelangelo claims that he had a, a lot of authority to put up uh, what he wanted to. It's hard to believe that. Uh, this is the papal chapel. And you're not going to just simply hire a, a, you know, someone and say, oh, why don't you do creation, throw a couple of prophets up there. Uh, the best, um, uh, uh, not guess, but an educated guess is um, that he was working with a theologian at the papal court. And the theologian at the papal court says, you know, this is, uh, this is what you need to depict here in uh, the creation of the earth. This is what you need to depict here, the separation of, of light from darkness. And give Michelangelo room within that to go ahead and, and, and do what he wanted. And certainly how, you know, his style is his own. Nobody told him about the style. Right? But the iconography, they probably have a pretty tight ring with Michelangelo. Do we know if anything was ever had? Did he ever have any new one? Um, Nothing pops into mind. Uh, he's actually, uh, he had, to, as far as how he's going to depict these things, he had pretty free reign, and uh, to the point that, and he's protected by the Pope. He's protected, uh, first of all, by Julius II, and, and, and then by Paul III. Um, after Paul III dies, and towards the end of his life, uh, there's a lot of blowback. When the Counter-Reformation comes in, and, and you, you get these um, uh, cardinals who are very stern, they don't like all the news. And as a matter of fact, they have them painted over. Not Michael, Michelangelo didn't do it, but others came in and painted over. Yeah, they, that, most of that's been removed. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Um, to his question earlier, it seems like God dividing light from darkness, wouldn't that be at the entrance, and then you work your way up to Jonah and Jesus at the altar? Because it's reversed. Yeah. So I know. is that? So you, it doesn't really flow like that way. It's just a flop. <laughs> you know what? Okay, uh, I, I, it, it does seem backwards. The one thing that I will say is, um, for oops, um, let me just do this right here. Oh, I've lost it. For you folks who go to uh, the Sistine Chapel today. Um, you are actually going to come in that door over there on the right hand side. And so the first thing you see when you look up is the separation of light from darkness. It, it will seem in perfectly logical order. But this was not the main entrance. The main entrance was on this end down here. Um, and it would, but I think it's connected to the altar. I really think that, you know, that's, um, that, that's probably why they did it. You probably don't want to have uh, the destruction of mankind over the high altar in the Sistine Chapel. That just wouldn't be good. What you have is, you know, God creating a perfect world, uh, leading away from hell. Yeah. My, my last question was, is all the ash removed in 2018 now, or is that a process? That <coughs> no, it's all been restoration has been started. done. Yeah, and it's, it's, all, it's all finished. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank God for the Japanese because uh, they, they stepped up and did a great job. Okay, uh, got time for one more question? Yes, please. Uh, oh, oh I thought you were the figure. Um, Right there. Is that what you're talking about, Peter? Yeah, yeah uh, these are uh, angels. They're surrounded by angels. Okay. Uh, four angels right there. Oh, okay. yeah. And the one on the left is an angel? No, that's God, actually. And he's showing a little 
skin? Can we say that? <laughs> I know, that's odd, isn't it? Isn't that, that's just absolutely wild. Uh, this is God, it's, it, we've got two days of creation right here. This is the creation of Earth over here, and then the creation of uh, the, the heavens and the planets over here. He's combining oh, the two. It's, it's almost a divided yeah. panel. Yeah, a divided panel. You see God is swirling, and God is active, and God, you know, he's creating physically right here, and I think that Michelangelo uh, uh, would have irritated Luther by that, because Luther wants to see creation through the miracle, right through the word. Okay, we've got to stop, uh, and I'll see you again next week. I hope. Thank you. Thank you.